so there is a term that my spiritual director likes to use with me, and every time he says it, I grind my teeth. Amy, this is a growing edge for you. Yeah. It's a real nice way of saying, you have some growing up to do, kid. This is work. Um, he always says it in a very loving way. But it usually means that there's something I'm holding on to that no longer works. Or that there is a truth that I am failing to fully see and embrace about myself, about the nature of life, what have you. We are in our second week of our Lenten series, From the Ashes, a place of destruction and death, place of surrender. And as I read from probably the most popular Lenten text, um, it's found in both Matthew and Luke, I'd like for you to think about this desert story as Jesus's growing edge. Matthew 4 verses 1 through 17. When Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tested by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, all these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness, have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The word of God for the people of God, and together we say, Thanks be to God for growing edges. Mm. Ooh, I'm grinding my teeth already. So, preacher and theologian Fred Craddock says that once he was teaching a college freshman class on this text, and there were about 80 students in the class, when the temptation story was read to them, how many of them do you think raised their hand when asked, was Jesus really tempted? 80 kids, how many of them thought Jesus was really tempted? Five. Five kids out of 80. Some were probably protecting their image of this unique son of God and the association with the word temptation. Others may have been responding on the assumption that temptation is synonymous with weakness, questionable character. 
But let's think about this for a moment. Real temptation is not a slippery slope downward. No. It's an enticement not to fall, but to rise up, to make ourselves more than. The tempter in Eden did not ask Eve, do you wish to be like the devil? No, 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 that was not the temptation. But do you wish to be like God? If you are really the son of God, says the tempter, this is not so much corruption as it is the attraction of success and acceptance. No self-respecting devil would approach a person with offers of personal, domestic, and social ruin. That's in the very fine print at the bottom. Real temptation often invites us to do something about which much good can be said. Stones to bread? Oh, plenty of hungry people hope so. Leap from the very top of the temple and be rescued? People who lack in faith and need a sign of hope? Hope so. Take over the governments of the world and fix this. Anyone who is oppressed? Hope so. And the tempter is even supported with scripture text. Quotes Psalm 91 to refute Jesus. How often is the Bible used against us to make us doubt ourselves? How often do we doubt our own convictions because someone throws scripture at us and we don't, we're not really sure if it's even in the Bible? Is that scripture? Wait, I need to find that. Is that true? Does it really say that? Well, we have work to do. Maybe that's a growing edge. Opening the Bible, knowing what's there. Matthew gives us a picture of a Jesus who shares the human condition. One who is tempted by the attraction of power, the promise of freedom from suffering, and the assurance of safety. These temptations are not something distant from us. No, they are a metaphor for things that we struggle with pretty much every day. But Jesus chooses to place his love for God and his trust for God's provision over the empty temptations of the world as an example of what it means to trust, to believe in love, he allows himself to be refined like fire and reduced to ash. And it's this story, particularly in Matthew, that establishes Jesus as the Son of God. It's from here that he goes out and begins his public ministry. It's important for us to know that he really was tempted. It helps us to identify with him, and it helps Jesus to see more like us. Real faith grows not from being rescued and comforted, but from trusting God even when it's hard, probably especially when it's hard. Instead of taking the shortcut to power, or chasing the promise of an easier way, Jesus shows us how to resist temptation and be delivered from evil. In Matthew 4, we get a beautiful telling of the demons that we all have to face in order to grow up and become mature in our faith. I haven't quoted him in a while, so I was due. Father Roar, there he is, I love him, says this about the temptation story. The first two temptations are preceded by the same phrase, if you are the Son of God. The primary temptation, he says, that we all face is to doubt our own divinity. Am I really beloved and of God? That's a growing edge. 
doubting our own identity. Once we doubt that, it's downhill from there. What made Jesus special, it seems, is that he never doubted that he was God's beloved son. So the first temptation is to misuse power. And maybe we could say it's a temptation to be spectacular, to be special and important, to be showy. The tempter says, turn these stones to bread. And when we are young, when we are new to our faith, we want that. We want to feel special. We want to stand out. We want to be noticed. We want that belief to be reflected. If I am beloved, show me. But Jesus refuses to play that game. Then the second temptation, the devil took him to the holy city and made him stand on the very pinnacle of the temple and tells him to throw himself down. The second great temptation is to misuse religion by playing games with God. Jesus says, I'm not going to play the religious game either. It's the transactional religion as opposed to the life-changing, transformational faith. But what religion is about is real transformation. Changing our mind toward love, changing our heart toward community, changing our body toward living here in this present moment on the growing edge of our faith. The third temptation is the temptation to political power, which is not inherently wrong. There has to be a way that we humans can use power for good. But until we are tested, until we don't need that power too much, we will always misuse it. If we're not tested in the ways of power, very often we end up worshiping power in order to get more power. What religion at its most mature level means is that there is one goal. There is one source, there is one focus, there is one meaning, and it is beyond us. It's not about making more money or being more famous or about winning. What we're given in the gospel is an agenda where everyone wins. We're all equally children of God. Jesus' entire ministry is dedicated to this message. The first thing he says when the time of temptation has ended is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here on this growing edge. Repent. The word usually translated in Greek is metanoia, which usually means something like turn your mind around, change your thinking. Most of us won't move toward any new way of thinking or actual change until we're forced to do so, which usually means it's got to hurt enough. There's got to be some disturbance to stir us up and motivate us to change. Otherwise, we'll just stay on the same habitual path until we bottom out and come to the limits of our own fuel supply. There is no reason. Why would we want to switch to a higher octane fuel? Why would we want to change? We will not learn to actively draw upon a larger source until our usual resources are depleted and revealed as wanting. In fact, we will not even know that there really is a larger source until our own source, our own resources, our own efforts fail us. Until and unless there is a person, a situation, an event, an idea, a conflict, a relationship, a human experience, that we cannot manage on our own. We will never give ourselves over in surrender to the true manager. 
Lent. Yeah, boo, it's hard. This is the invitation of Lent. Be reduced to ash. Surrender to the fire. Repent. Be transformed and find heaven right there on the growing edge of your life. There are no shortcuts as we experience our own deserts in life. There is an Orthodox author and priest, I don't think I'm saying his name right, John Chrysavagus. Sorry, John. Uh, he says that the desert is a symbol of both desertedness and God's presence. Anyone who has experienced some aspect of desertedness, that is to say some form of loneliness or brokenness, breakdown, breakup, whether it's emotional, physical, or social, they will be able to make the necessary connections. Each of us has known times of drought, dry and arid moments where we await refreshment and rain, where we hope and wait for life. The desert, while accursed in the scriptures, was never seen as an empty region. It was a place that was full of action. It was a space that provided an opportunity and even a calling for divine vision. In the desert, you're invited to shake off all forms of idolatry and earthly limitations in order to behold, or rather, to be held before an image of the heavenly God. There you were confronted with another reality, with the presence of a boundless God whose grace was without any limits at all. You could never avoid that perspective of revelation. After all, you cannot hide in the desert. There's no room for lying or deceit there. Your very self is reflected in the dry desert, and you're obliged to face up to this self. Anything else would constitute a dangerous illusion, not a divine reflection. The desert is a place of spiritual revolution, not of personal retreat. It's a place of inner protest, not outward peace. A place of deep encounter, not superficial escape. A place of repentance, not recuperation. Living in the desert does not mean living without people. It means living for God. Chrysavages encourages us to face desert experiences instead of running away. He says, one does not have to move to the geographical location of wilderness in order to find God. Yet, if you do not have to go to the desert, you do have to go through the desert. The desert is a necessary stage on the spiritual journey. To avoid it would be harmful. To dress it up or conceal it may be tempting, but it also proves destructive on the spiritual path. Ironically, you don't have to go looking for the desert, he says. It normally finds its way to you or catches up to you. So there's good news. Everyone goes through the desert. It may be in the form of some suffering or emptiness or some kind of trauma. But dressing it up through our addictions or attachments to material goods or money or food, drink, success, obsessions, or anything else, anything else we may care to turn toward or find available to depend upon will only delay the utter loneliness and inner fearfulness of the desert experience. If we go through it involuntarily, then it can be, invol it can be overwhelming and crushing. If, however, we go through this voluntarily, if we choose to enter the desert wilderness, the growing edge. It can be constructive and liberating. Howard Thurman was an American author, a philosopher, theologian, a mystic. One of my favorite, I don't even know if he called himself a poet, but what I'm about to read is so beautiful it sounds like poetry to me. He was a civil rights leader in the 20th century, and he said this about repentance and growth. Look well 
to the growing edge. All around us, worlds are dying and new worlds are being born. All around us, life is dying and life is being born. The fruit ripens on the tree. The roots are silently at work in the darkness of the earth against a time when there shall be new leaves, fresh blossoms, green fruit. Such is the growing edge. It is the extra breath from the exhausted lung. The one more thing to try when all else has failed. The upward reach of life when weariness closes in upon all endeavor. This is the basis of hope in moments of despair. The incentive to carry on when times are out of joint and men and women have lost their reason. The source of confidence when worlds crash and dreams whiten into ash. Such is the growing edge incarnate. Look well to the growing edge. Living in the desert of Lent does not mean living alone. It means living with God. Let us look well to the growing edge. Amen.